We will We will do what Pavala could not. Greetings, programs. Joel Buddy Ingrid Bernal. This is uh, Hank and Fernhill coming at you for Drunkens and Dragons as a rune hammer. All up in this spot right here. Back with another awesome episode of rune design. And this time we are going to talk about a little design that I'm calling the hive. Now, it's not necessarily a hive in the traditional sense, like a hive, but I guess it earned its title because it's a hive. Have you ever wanted to figure out a boss fight for your group that's going to actually challenge them rather than just make them wonder how long they can sit at the table while they grind down a pool of 730 hit points? This room design is called the hive and basically the idea here is a mechanic that you can plug in in any way in your game especially when it comes to some of these more hardcore battles which is kind of my specialty let's face it i don't really talk a lot about role-playing encounters that much or social intrigue or um, traveling mechanics which i get asked about all the time when it comes to traveling i just put on some classic rock and say you travel and it's over <laughs> so this is going to be a gnarly battle that hopefully is going to provide some real substantial challenge to a group and maybe even to a higher level group when you have a group of adventurers over fifth level challenging them in any real way becomes a challenge in itself it becomes becomes quite difficult so this encounter is designed to put players like that to the test the easiest way to plug this into your game would be to take it as i've written it which is literally a hive so it's a it's a hexagonal space occupied by giant insects, possibly this bee-like, wasp-like creature. Or maybe you take a remoraz and cut this hive into ice. You could do it in many different ways. So I like to imagine it in this sort of bug context, in a bee-like context. And not only because, not only because of the hive name, but also the mechanic kind of lends itself to this sort of nested kind of look, the way that a fly's eye has all those different facets. This room has these sort of facets, and the way that I've mapped it out, it has five facets on it, then your main space, and then your entry down at the bottom, okay? And you have your boss, where my sort of skull and crossbones are here, um, up in the center. The long and the short of how the hive works is that players enter, they have their big bad, so for the sake of my example, it's a remoraz, right? But it's like this wasp remoraz. It's like this sort of a queen remoraz. And so it's, it's got more of a, a black and yellow look rather than the traditional kind of heat inside the ice kind of look. And this thing is up there. You don't have to worry about a lot of role playing because these things can't talk. So they're just like... And it's like, if we don't kill this thing, we're never going to get the antidote to the frigid woe, which is killing all the people on the Menagerie Coast. It's a little wild mount plug right there. Also, it's been terrorizing the entire area, and we're the only ones who can stop it. Okay, so they're going to go up against this, this big central monster. Now, that's easy. You've done that in your game. You know, you have a big central monster. It has like three to four actions, a ton of hit points, really high damage spikes, and a regeneration phase. It has a go underground phase where it's not accessible, and then it pops up somewhere else so it can jump attack players. You're going to do all that cool stuff. But what's different about the hive is the cells around it. So when you do describe this space you need to make sure to describe the translucent hexagonal membranes that are numerous and all over the walls of this sort of huge maybe dodecahedral space that this giant queen remoraz is inhabiting these membranes these hexagonal membranes that wall the lines they're actually or line the walls they don't wall the lines walling the lines is like something that pink floyd did in the 70s no these line the walls and they're made out of some kind of organic material, okay? It doesn't have to be wax because that would be a little bit obvious, but there's some kind of strange organic material that is doing all of these or covering all of these membranes in this room. The fight begins. Always in the neck, right? The stinger comes in right on the bard. The battle is joined. And then when your first timer runs out would be how I would do it. Or you could do it on a two round. You could just make it fixed so that you're not rolling. Sometimes rolling a timer can make your battle too hard to control because four rounds is a hell of a lot longer than one. <laughs> so let's, for the sake of this design, call it every two rounds. 
the remoras sort of folds its legs in and goes whoosh, and shoots out this crazy like web rope that yanks one player who's randomly selected and throws them up through one of these organic membranes into one of these small hexagonal chambers. <laughs> Slings them up in there like a grapple hook or like a like a wacky wall crawler. What were those things called? It had a little rubber hand on the end and you're like, whoosh, and it was a great way to get kicked out of class like in fourth grade. So it's just like that thing. Whoosh, sucks them, ah, go up through this organic membrane into this hexagonal chamber. And then the hexagonal chamber quickly closes behind them. And here's the key to the design. That character is now isolated from their group. They're not visible to the group. They can't be reached by, by spells or by any other means. They are alone in their own little chamber. And in that little chamber, one of these young wasp or more as pupae emerges and it's there to feed. This is how the queen remoras feeds her young as she puts living things inside these chambers and then just waits and the pupae devour them. The character who is slung up in there is now faced with an interesting challenge. And the group who's outside in the main chamber is faced with an interesting challenge. So let's attack those in order. The isolated character has this very narrow window of time to not only kill this pupae thing that's about to eat it, which is terrifying right there, and make your description reinforce that terrifyingness. I mean, pupae in general, you, you know, if you really want to shoot the moon, you could have this thing sort of look like a kind of like a tardigrade, but it's like three feet long. Like, oh my God. Imagine that thing like crawling up your leg, just like, like terrible. And add some slime for good measure. So you have this horrifying pupae. You're by yourself. You not only need to stab this thing or blow it apart with a magic spell quickly, you need to get through the membrane. So the membrane maybe has a trivial amount of hit points that tests for one solid hit. Something like eight hit points would be about right. So a gimpy hit won't break it and it takes no damage. It takes nine or nothing, basically, to get out of this membrane. So the player kills the pupae. Whew, that was disgusting. And then like, I got to get back to my friends. And they can hear like muffled yells and the din of battle outside the membrane. Then they, ah, ah, bleh, 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 and they slice the membrane, jump back into the battle, and the membrane heals behind them. And they've escaped their little isolation phase. So that's the first challenge. But the real magic of this design is the second challenge, which is the group, while that player is inside their little sort of isolation chamber as food, is without that character. The fewer number of characters in your group, the higher the impact of this design on the battle. So if you only have three characters in your group and one of them gets isolated, their chances of wiping are really, really high. Two people against a boss is just not going to go well. If there's five characters in your group, which is much more common, it's going to be more survivable. But here's the key. Who gets thrown into the isolation chamber? If it's your healer or your tank, it's one of your sort of group critical characters, it's going to be a major problem. Or like your only high hit point character gets thrown into there. You've got a very high chance of a lot of people dropping to zero all at the same time. Also, there's the possibility if time unfolds in a slow enough fashion that more than one character can be slung up into an isolation chamber. You see, if it takes the first character slung up more than two rounds to get out, then another one's going to go in. And now your party is decreased by two and they're isolated from each other, faced with their own isolated, segmented combat challenges. And so whoever's remaining engaging the Queen Remoras is becoming more and more desperate and they need to find a way to solve this battle. Okay, so there you have the lay of the land and the lay of the dynamics of the encounter. Now what you need to think about is the Queen Remoras itself or whatever the boss is going to be that you're going to use in your design. If this monster has too spiky or too volatile of damage output, this encounter will not be survivable. You will sling the first character into the isolation chamber and then you'll drop three of the other characters if your damage is volatile. Now normally, dropping three characters with a giant weapon from a boss level creature is a great thing. You're, remember, you're vending fear as a dungeon master. So like, you want them to be scared. If they're scared of the boss, you've done your job. 
In this case, you want to even it out. So you want to bring the maximum damage down, but you want to bring the minimum damage up. So you want to compress it. Now, a normal way to do this is instead of using large dice for the damage on the monster, you use multiples of small dice. This gives you a more controllable damage output. Using multiples of smaller dice tends to give you a more consistent damage output, more like a, a sort of a, a fire hose of damage rather than explosions and spikes, which is like breath weapons and crazy stuff like that. So this Remoraz is and then you know, breathing poison, I don't know, poison secretions or so. Secretions is not a word I really wanted to say, but I'm not comfortable with that. I think I've been triggered. <laughs> You've got this, this fire hose of median level damage. And the key about that median level damage is that players can start to understand damage over time. And they can start to see if we don't have enough people to absorb this much damage over this much time, we do not have a chance at this. So A, we need to get smarter how quickly we get out of the isolation chambers. And B, we might need to find a way to disable its ability to sling us into the isolation chambers, or C, maybe instead of focusing all of our efforts on the Queen Remoraz, we need to start working on destroying these membranes so that the isolation chambers don't function. I don't know if they're gonna do any of those options or come up with their own option, probably the latter and not the former. That's not my challenge as the dungeon master. My challenge is to design something that divides them to conquer them. Now, the worst, the worst outcome that you can have with the hive is someone is thrown into an isolation chamber, cannot muster enough damage, like just has bad dice that night, can't beat the pupae, and the pupae eats them enough to drop them to zero, and they're up there making death saves by themselves with no access to healing, and they die in that isolation chamber. That's a gnarly, gnarly player death, and a way that you could remind players that this is a very real possibility is to have a half digested skeleton in one of the isolation chambers or in several of the isolation chambers um, or and it could be like a wolf or it could be a bear skeleton it could be a person it could be a halfling if you really want to twist the knife <laughs> oh god a halfly digested halfling halfly skeleton <laughs> Things are getting a little crazy in quarantine. Okay, so that's really the, basically the idea of the hive. Now, like all my room designs, I have to leave to you the details of figuring out your boss monster in a way that works. Um, the details of figuring out your pupae stats so that they aren't quite unbeatable, but it should be a very scary challenge to fight this thing by yourself without the help of your homies and maybe without any heals. Maybe you just have a potion on you or something, but it's not just can you defeat the pupae. It's like you've got to get out of there fast. Probably what you'll see is more resources will be burnt by players to get out of the isolation chamber fast than to fight the Queen Remoraz itself. And that is kind of what you're looking for here as far as creating challenge. Because then your players are taking on this huge creature without a lot of their, their sort of tricks and gadgets. They are more forced into creative thinking. Now to really put the, the, the bow on this for a birthday present of pure terror, you're going to want to block the exit. And again, you can use this organic membrane, which almost does asks for no explanation that's one thing i like about it so as they enter this hive core behind them it goes and it it grows over with this membrane material which is somewhere between like translucent skin or or like fatty blubber and wax it's this really creepy weird stuff and it has a ton of hit points so it could be chopped or burned through for an escape but chopping or burn through burning through it should be very difficult so that it would provide another possible outcome for players, but it's not just a, 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 you know, an eject switch. It's not just a ripcord where they can be like, this boss fight is crazy, I'm out. The other thing you can do, if you don't feel like blocking the exit, which feels a little cheesy, is you can make this, the stakes are so high on defeating this monster that if they leave and they don't succeed, that an entire town will succumb to this, you know, the frigid woe is what I've been playing with from Wildmount. Um, but it could be anything. It could be that 
there are more of these things that are multiplying because the Queen Remoraz is like overbreeding and it's infesting this whole mountain range. And if they don't stop it now, it's going to reach some of the bigger cities in your world and become a completely unstoppable wave of insect horror. So the stakes are very high. They're not trapped here by physical means. They're trapped here by necessity. And that's a much more nuanced and, and sort of um, meaty way to trap your players. You're not literally trapping them. You're mentally trapping. You're, you're morally trapping them. That's the hive. It's a way to bring a characters in, have them fight this big main monster, but then pluck them out of the battle and put them in their own little sort of corner of isolation, <laughs> a glass case of emotion. Another tight, small, simple room design that should be easy to remember and easy to get inside your head, but then there's lots of fun and interesting work to do to bring it to your table in your way, which is, let's face it, the number one important thing about our hobby. Our hobby isn't cool because you read something and play it as written. It's cool because we can create and warp and twist everything into our table, our moment, and our story. So do that with the hive, and I hope this boss fight works out for you, meaning you kill them all. <laughs> and then the plague of the wasp remoras covered all the land in a black and yellow death that crawled by moonlight. <laughs> I'm going to get out of here, you guys. I'm sure there's something that I need to be doing something really important that I need to be doing that I'm not doing right now. Oh wait, no there's not. <laughs>